Hey everyone, welcome back to another Bio365S discussion. Um, this is the first discussion for Unit 3 material, and it starts with the respiratory system. So before you watch this discussion, you should have already watched all of the Chapter 17 lectures um, that Ian posted on the respiratory system. So this is the first discussion that we have from uh, the respiratory system, and I have an outline of what I want to go over. And I'll start by just reviewing some topics that you've already heard in lecture, such as the kind of basic anatomy of the respiratory tree, the difference between the conducting and exchange zones, the important respiratory muscles, and then we'll look at the path that like one molecule of O2 and CO2 take um, in your respiratory and cardiovascular system. And then we'll touch on the spirometry that you need to know, as well as the two equations that you need to know and a new Marvel problem for practice. And just as a reminder, from here on out for the rest of the semester, anything that is from the discussion sheet that you need to know will be covered in these videos. Um, so these videos are going to be more content review, not so much problem solving. But if I ever do pull something from a discussion sheet or do a problem that you need to know, then I'm covering it in this video. Okay, so let's jump right in with the respiratory tree. So in class, Ian talked about how we have kind of two branches of the respiratory system. We have the upper respiratory system and oh, that's in white. You can't see that. You have the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. So your upper respiratory system is really just like your oral cavity. So where your mouth, your nose are, where you kind of breathe in air. Um, and this, a lot of these structures is where air and food goes into. Um, well, at least for your mouth, where food goes into. So food and air will travel into your mouth, and then food will travel into the uh, esophagus, but then air will travel into the larynx, um, and then eventually into the trachea. So from the larynx to the trachea, we start our lower respiratory tree. And our lower respiratory tree is the trachea, which branches into primary bronchi, which branch into secondary bronchi, which keep branching into smaller and smaller bronchi until they get to bronchioles. And then the bronchioles end up going to alveoli. So if we were to look at this a little bit closer, this is what I was just talking through. So we said that the trachea branches into the primary bronchi, which branches into smaller and smaller bronchi, and the bronchioles eventually end up going to the alveoli. So we see here that there's another division within the lower respiratory tree. So we have a conducting zone and we have an exchange zone. So exchange zone is just the alveoli. So just the alveoli is the exchange zone. And it's called the exchange zone because this is where we have exchange of gases such as O2 and CO2. So that means that everything above the alveoli in the conducting zone, there is no gas exchange. So within the trachea, primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary, and so on, there is no gas exchange. So you don't have any gas exchange until you get to the alveoli. And then if we look to the far right on this chart, we see that uh, we have the area for each of these tubes. So for the trachea, well, we have one trachea, and it is 2.5 uh, square centimeters. So we see that as the respiratory tree starts to branch into smaller and smaller tubes, we get more of those tubes. So by the time we get down to the alveoli, we have a ton of alveoli, and they have a huge surface area. So 1 times 10 to the 6th square centimeters. So this was something Ian touched on in class too. Um, I did a little unit conversion just to put this into perspective. Um, one million square centimeters converted into square feet is 1,076.4 square feet. So this is the total surface area of the exchange zone of your lungs, your alveoli, and this is a huge surface area. 
Um, to put it into perspective, my apartment is around six to 700 square feet. So not nearly as big as the surface area of the lungs. So your lungs are very overbuilt. They have a huge surface area that allows for gas exchange. Okay, moving on, I want to talk about some, some important things for the respiratory muscles. So on this side, we have the inspiratory and expiratory muscles um, kind of divided into the two sides. But the main one I want to talk about is the big one, the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is by far the main respiratory muscle that you use. And we talked about this kind of when we talked about the respiratory pump for the cardiovascular system and increasing venous return. Um, but we talked about when you inhale, your diaphragm contracts and it lowers. So when you inhale, you are contracting your inspiratory muscles and they are uh, expanding the thoracic cage. Now, when you go to exhale, you are not necessarily contracting the expiratory muscles, at least in quiet or passive breathing. So in quiet breathing, in quiet breathing or passive breathing, you're not really using the expiratory muscles because you are not forcefully getting air out when you're just sitting down and quietly breathing. So your exhale during quiet breathing just comes from the relaxation of the inspiratory muscles, the recoil of them. When they stop contracting, they will recoil and that recoil or their return to their normal resting position will just push on the lungs and cause you to exhale. Now, the reason why we have expiratory muscles is because we are not always quiet breathing. Um, if you are breathing hard or if you need to forcefully breathe out, kind of like a cough, then you need to contract these expiratory muscles. And when you forcefully contract those expiratory muscles, you are forcing air out. That's what you do when you cough. You are forcefully breathing out. So I just wanted to make the distinction on when do you actually use the expiratory muscles and when do you not? So quiet breathing, you're not using them, uh, but if you're forcefully breathing out or coughing, you are using them. Okay, so now getting into um, kind of some gas transport topics. So for this, I have pulled a slide from Ian's lectures. And this is one of the most important pictures to understand for the respiratory system and gas transport in general. All right, so we have, just to kind of tell you what you're looking at here, we have one alveoli at the top, and then we have pulmonary circulation coming in and then returning to the heart here. And then we have systemic circulation going out and then systemic circulation coming back to the heart. So at the end of the systemic circulation here, we have some sort of tissue. It's just a cell in your body that needs oxygen. And it's broken up into these different phases. So you have the exchange phase, and then the transport of blood, and then another exchange phase. So I have labeled these arbitrarily as one, two, three, and four. And then you see here on the side, I have it labeled as one, two, three, four, three, two, one. So we're gonna be going um, and following the path that oxygen would take. So this oxygen molecule, the path it takes from the atmosphere to your cells. And then the path that one molecule of CO2 takes from your cells out into the atmosphere. So let's do that. So starting with phase one, the first phase of exchange. The first thing that we need to do to get oxygen in is to create a negative pressure in the lungs. So negative pressure in lungs. So that negative pressure in the lungs relative to the atmosphere means that a fluid, such as gas, will flow from high to low pressure. 
So this gets O2 into the lungs, or into the alveoli. So O2 into alveoli. All right, so once this molecule of O2 is here in the alveoli, the next thing that we need to do is get it into our blood. So that molecule of O2 will diffuse into our blood. It will diffuse into blood from alveoli. Alright, so we know that oxygen isn't just kind of dissolved in our blood. I mean, some of it is, very little of it is, but we know that a majority of oxygen is bound to an oxygen-carrying protein called hemoglobin. So we know that hemoglobin, and the abbreviation for hemoglobin is Hb, so hemoglobin picks up oxygen. So we know that hemoglobin will pick up oxygen. All right, so now to step three, we now have HbO2. That stands for um, oxygenated hemoglobin or oxyhemoglobin. So HbO2 will travel to the systemic circulation, well, back to the heart and then systemic circulation, but it will travel to tissues, tissues that need oxygen. And when it gets to those tissues, it will release oxygen. So step three was just it traveling to the tissues. Now step four is hemoglobin releases O2 to tissues. But these tissues, let's say this is something like a muscle cell. Let's say this is a muscle cell. Um, if these cells are undergoing cellular respiration, that means they are consuming O2 and producing CO2 as a byproduct of ATP. So if they are releasing O2, we need to get rid of this CO2. So hemoglobin will release O2, but then hemoglobin picks up CO2. So we have another gas exchange here. Release O2 to the tissues, pick up the CO2 that was created. So now going back to step three. So it's step three because we're dealing with the transport of gases in blood. We have hemoglobin bound to CO2 this time. And HbCO2 will travel to the lungs this time will travel back to lungs. All right, so once that deoxygenated blood gets back to the pulmonary circulation, that blood will come in contact with the alveoli, and the CO2 that is bound to hemoglobin will be released, and it will diffuse into the alveoli. So we get CO2 CO2 diffuses into alveoli from blood. So I'm going to add one more thing to the previous step three. Um, once it travels back to the lungs and back to the alveoli, hemoglobin will release CO2. It has to first unbind CO2 for CO2 to actually diffuse out. All right, so going to back to step two now, CO2 diffuses into the alveoli from blood. Now from here, we have that molecule of CO2 in the alveoli. So we are looking, we are looking right here. We have that molecule of CO2 in the alveoli. All we need to do is exhale. So we create positive pressure in the lungs, and that positive pressure relative to atmospheric causes CO2 to be exhaled into the atmosphere, and that's how we get rid of CO2. 
So CO2 will leave the lungs due to the positive pressure we create when our inspiratory muscles relax or if you are forcefully coughing when the expiratory muscles contract. So that is the path that one molecule of O2 takes to get into the body and then into the cells and the path that one molecule of CO2 takes from the cells out of the body and into the atmosphere. So I have another diagram showing this. And this is actually from the gas transport lecture, so the chapter 18 lecture, I believe. Um, it's a very similar picture. It just has concentration gradients shown, um, or rather partial pressure gradients. So we know that gases always move from a high pressure to a low pressure. Just like how your blood always moves from a high to low pressure. So if we were to look at one molecule of O2 going out, I'm sorry, uh, starting from outside the body, we see that the concentration of O2 out is 160 millimeters of mercury. So if we need to get O2 into the lungs, then that means the concentration of O2 in the alveoli has to be less than 160. It is, so that means O2 will enter the alveoli. So we now have O2 in the alveoli. So if it is 100 millimeters of mercury in the alveoli and it needs to get into the blood, well, we need to have a lower concentration of oxygen in the blood in order for that to happen. So when oxygen enters the blood, it's shown here entering in um, kind of the arterial blood, but that's not actually what's happening. Oxygen goes into venous blood because venous blood is deoxygenated. And the concentration of O2 in venous blood is less than 40. So 100 to 40, that means O2 enters the blood. And the blood becomes oxygenated. Once it becomes oxygenated, it becomes arterial blood. So this 100 millimeters of mercury. So that 100 of millimeters of mercury um, is representing the concentration of oxygen or the partial pressure of oxygen. So now that's going to go into systemic circulation. So oxygen is now in systemic circulation. And we know that oxygen gets delivered to the cells. Well, the concentration of O2 in the cells is less than 40. And in arterial blood, it was 100. So oxygen is going to move from high to low and enter the cells. So that's how we get one molecule of oxygen from the atmosphere to the cells based on the partial pressure gradients. So next let's look at the same thing but let's start with CO2. So we know that CO2 enters the blood and the concentration of CO2 is inside of the cells greater than 46 millimeters of mercury. And this CO2 is entering the arterial blood because the arterial blood comes in, drops off oxygen, and then picks up CO2. So it's going from uh, 46 millimeters of mercury to 40, so the high to low. And then once CO2 enters the blood, it becomes the 46 millimeters of mercury we see over here. Alright, so this CO2 will travel into systemic circulation back to the right side of the heart and then eventually back to pulmonary circulation. So I'm going to erase some of these lines up here so we don't get thrown off by our O2. So if CO2 now is in the lungs and it is in deoxygenated blood which has pCO2 greater than 46, well we need to get this CO2 out into the alveoli. And we see that the CO2 in the alveoli is 40. So the high to low again makes CO2 go down its gradient. And then the CO2 in the atmosphere is extremely low. It's just 0.25 millimeters of mercury. So high to low, CO2 gets out into the atmosphere. So that's the exact same thing we just went over in the previous uh, picture, but now we had partial pressure gradients linked to it just so that you can see um, that gases are always moving from a high to low pressure. 
All right, so that's it for the content review from Ian's lecture, really. Um, and then this next part is pulled from the discussion worksheet. And this is the first page of the discussion worksheet for spirometry. So this is, this is spirometry now. All right, so spirometry is, um, or a spirometer is a clinical tool used to assess the function of the lungs. Um, it gives you volumes of the lungs, like how much you're breathing in, how much you're breathing out, um, how forcefully, or how much air can you forcefully exhale, how much air can you forcefully inhale, that sort of thing. So it kind of assesses the functions of the lungs. And if you are in kinesiology or exercise physiology, there is a lab where you work with a spirometer. I don't know if you'll end up doing it this semester since everything is now online, uh, but maybe some of you in ex-phys or exercise science have seen this before. Okay, so uh, if you've ever used a spirometer, then you know that you're kind of hooked up to this little tube and people will instruct you on how to breathe. So the first thing that they will tell you to do is to just breathe normally. So just breathe like you currently are at rest. When you do that, you produce, oh, that's in white, you can't see that. When you breathe normally, you produce these little waves here. Number one, that is called your tidal volume. So your tidal volume is the volume of air Um, the volume of air that you breathe during normal breathing. So the volume of air during normal or quiet breathing. So from looking at this, we can see that the tidal volume by looking at the x-axis is maybe about 600 milliliters or so. Um, yeah, it's about 600 milliliters. Uh, not that that number is important, but that's just saying that this person breathes in 600 milliliters and breathes out 600 milliliters every breath while just sitting, um, while just sitting and quietly breathing. So that is your tidal volume. So if you were to breathe normally, the next thing someone would instruct you to do is from a normal breath, try to bring in as much air as you possibly can into your lungs. And when you do that, you produce number two. Number two is called your inspiratory reserve volume. So inspiratory reserve volume is the volume you can maximally inhale. So it's the volume you can maximally inhale from a normal breath. Or from your tidal volume, from your tidal volume. So the word reserve in here helps me understand what's going on conceptually because the word reserve implies that you have this extra space in your lungs that you kind of have on reserve. Like you're not normally filling this space with air, but if you needed to, you could tap into that space. So you kind of have that space on reserve. So your inspiratory reserve volume is the uh, volume you can maximally inhale starting from a normal breath. Okay, now from here, um, they will ask you to return to your normal breath. So you'll go back to one. So I'm going to continue this here. So starting from a normal breath, they will ask you to maximally exhale. Let me redraw that. They will maximally exhale. And you will get number three. So the reason why I continued the tidal volume here is just to show you that number three is starting from a normal breath. So no number three is your expiratory reserve volume. And it's very similar to the inspiratory reserve volume. It's the volume you you can maximally exhale from 
um, from a normal breath. So if you are just breathing normally, they will ask you at the end of a normal breath, try to force as much air out of your lungs as you possibly can. When you do that, you get your expiratory reserve volume. Okay, now if you force as much air as you possibly can out of your lungs, the volume that you're left with at the end is your residual volume. This is the volume you can never get out of your lungs. So it's the volume you can never get out of your lungs, no matter how hard you try. There's always going to be a little bit of air left over in your lungs, and that little bit of air just helps keep your lungs distended. Um, it keeps it from collapsing. You don't want zero air or zero milliliters of air in your lungs because that means they have collapsed. So you always want a little bit of air because it just keeps them slightly expanded. So your residual volume is the air that you can never get out of your lungs. Okay, so all of these that I've gone over so far, the individual numbers, those are your volumes. When you start to add them together, we start to get a capacity. So over here, these are our capacities. So if we were to look at 1 plus 2, that's your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume. That gives you your inspiratory So your inspiratory capacity is the total amount of air you can inhale starting from a normal breath. So the only difference from inspiratory reserve volume is that it also accounts for your tidal volume. So it's your tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume in equals your inspiratory capacity. So the total amount of air you can breathe in. So two plus three now, I'll explain what this is. So this is what the graph is showing. It's a maximal inhale to a maximal exhale. When you do that, this is called your vital capacity. So the reason before why I, I kept your tidal volume going is because I wanted to show that three wasn't starting from a maximal inhale. Three was starting from your tidal volume. But 2 plus 3 is a maximal inhale to a maximal exhale. That is called your vital capacity. You might also see this as your forced vital capacity um, online or clinically, um, but it's just the amount of air you can maximally inhale and then how much air you can maximally exhale on top of the max inhale. Okay, 3 plus 4 now. So starting from starting from your tidal volume, the amount of air that you don't get out during normal breathing is called your functional residual capacity. So functional residual capacity, it is very similar to your residual volume, but you can think of it as your residual volume during quiet breathing. So when you're normally breathing up here and it's just these small waves, when you're normally breathing, you're not always you're you're not getting to your residual volume down here. You're not always maximally exhaling when you're just sitting and breathing. So the amount of air that you are consistently not getting out of your lungs when you are normal breathing is the functional residual capacity. Okay, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is your total lung capacity. It's the total amount of air you can hold in your lungs. So total lung capacity. Alright, so that is, or those are the uh, terms you need to know for spirometry. I don't want you to focus on these y values here. If you ever need to use a volume 
in a calculation, we will provide you those volumes because it differs from person to person. Um, people's volumes differ, their capacities differ. So if we ever ask you a math problem about these, we would have to provide that person's, let's say, title volume, something like that. Or we would have to uh, provide someone's residual volume, stuff like that. So don't worry about memorizing these Y values for these terms, just the concept of them. Okay, so before we get into our practice problem, I need to tell you two equations, and I need more room here to do that. So there are two equations that you need to know um, for the respiratory system. The first one is total pulmonary ventilation. So these are equations you need to know. So total pulmonary ventilation, abbreviated TPV, is equal to your respiratory rate times your tidal volume. So respiratory rate times tidal volume. So respiratory rate is breaths per minute. So the amount of times you breathe in a minute. Tidal volume is the amount of volume you breathe in for every breath. So reminder that tidal volume is the volume you're breathing in during normal breathing, but it's the volume you're breathing in per breath during normal breathing. So if you multiply these two together, the breaths cancel and TPV is equal to volume per minute. So your total pulmonary ventilation is the total volume of air your lungs are bringing in every minute. This is really similar to this equation that you were tested on last week, cardiac output. It's essentially the pulmonary equivalent to the cardiac output equation. So total pulmonary ventilation, TPV, that's the first equation. Oops. Okay, so the second equation is alveolar ventilation. So alveolar ventilation is equal to respiratory rate times tidal volume minus dead space. So DS stands for dead space. So I need to explain what dead space is. And I should have done that up here. Um, so going back to this picture with the respiratory tree. So here we talked about the exchange surface being the alveoli, everything above it being the conducting system. And then I told you here that in the conducting system, there's no gas exchange. So no gas exchange here. Because there's no gas exchange in the conducting system, we call the conducting system dead space. It's referred to as anatomical dead space because those structures, that area, does not participate in gas exchange. So going back down to this equation, you now know that dead space is the air that is kind of stuck in your respiratory tree the air that has not reached the alveoli. All right, so the way you know how much someone's dead space is, is by knowing this uh, conversion. So one milliliter of dead space So one milliliter of dead space for every one pound of body weight. 
So this is about the only time you'll ever use pounds in science, but the conversion here is one pound of body weight equals one milliliter of dead space. I'm not sure where this conversion came from, um, but it is important for being able to solve the alveolar ventilation equation. So if we tell you someone weighs 120 pounds, that means their dead space is 120 milliliters. All right, so let's do the units on this again. Respiratory rate is again breaths per minute. And then tidal volume, we said was also breaths, uh, I'm sorry, volume per breath. Let me erase this. Tidal volume is the volume per breath during normal breathing. Dead space is also volume per breath. This is subtraction, so they have to have the same unit to be subtracted from one another. So dead space is the volume of air per breath that is not reaching your alveoli. So I'll say that again. Dead space is the volume of air per breath that is not reaching the alveoli. If it's not reaching the alveoli, that means it is not participating in gas exchange. So when we uh, multiply these two together, breaths will end up canceling. Alveolar ventilation is still volume per minute. Okay, but the difference between alveolar ventilation and total pulmonary ventilation is that alveolar ventilation accounts for dead space. The fact that it accounts for dead space tells us that alveolar ventilation will be less than total pulmonary ventilation because total pulmonary ventilation includes all of the air that enters the lungs. Alveolar ventilation takes into account the dead space so it's a more accurate representation of how much air you are actually using for gas exchange. All right, so using these equations, let's do a practice problem. So this practice problem um, says that Kamala Khan is watching Luke Cage on Netflix. And you can tell this problem was written a few years ago because Luke Cage was still a show. Back when this was written, um, it has since been canceled along with pretty much every other Marvel series on Netflix. Um, but Kamala Khan was watching Luke Cage and it tells us that in 15 seconds she takes three breaths and that each breath holds 700 milliliters. All right, so there's some questions here. It asks, what is TPV? What is alveolar ventilation? And then it asks some other questions. So when breathing normally, how much air is she bringing in? That's to say, what is her tidal volume? And then the next one says, how much of that air remains in her airways? So how much dead space does she have? And then the last one is, how much of her tidal volume enters her alveoli? So from here, if you would like to pause the video and try to work out all of these questions, try to answer these three first and then do your calculations. But if you want to take a few minutes, pause the video, and then when you come back, I will work through them. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is to answer these uh, questions on the bottom. So when breathing in normally, what is her tidal volume? Well, the problem tells us, it tells us each breath holds 700 milliliters. We know that this is her tidal volume, because she's sitting on the couch. If you're sitting on the couch, this is your normal quiet breathing, so this is your tidal volume. All right, and then it says, how much air remains in the airways? So we need to use this conversion up here. So we have Kamala's body weight is 60 kilograms, but we need to convert this to pounds. So the conversion to pounds is one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. So when you do that, and I don't know this number off the top of my head, so 60 times 2.2 gives us 132 pounds. All right, using that conversion, 132 pounds equals 132 milliliters. So her dead space is 132 milliliters. 
All right, so it says how much of her tidal volume enters her alveoli. This is saying what is tidal volume minus dead space. That's what it's asking us to do. So 700 minus 132. And that gives us 568 milliliters. So we know that of the 700 mils, only 568 actually hits her alveoli and participates in gas exchange. Okay, so let's solve for TPV and AV. So we need our equations again. So when looking at this, we know tidal volume, but we don't know respiratory rate. So if we look back at the question, there's one more piece of information we haven't used. The first or the second sentence says, uh, in 15 seconds, she takes three breaths. So if we know that three breaths occur in 15 seconds, then we can set this equal to x breaths in 60 seconds. So when you do that, you just multiply by 4 to extrapolate to a minute. So we get 12 breaths per 1 minute, or 60 seconds. So our respiratory rate is 12 breaths per minute. So going down here, we have 12 breaths per minute times the 700 mils per breath. And I don't remember this off the top of my head either, but we know breaths will cancel. So 12 times 700 is 8,400 milliliters per minute. You can also write this in liters. It would just be 8.4 liters per minute. So that is her total pulmonary ventilation. So the next part of this question was to calculate alveolar ventilation, which we know is respiratory rate times tidal volume minus dead space. Now, luckily, we already have this number calculated. It was 568 because the question above had asked us to do that. So we're going to just plug right into this equation, 12 breaths per minute times 568 mils per breath. So in my calculator, I get that alveolar ventilation is 6,816 milliliters per minute or 6.816 liters per minute. Either one is fine as long as your units are correct. So that is her alveolar ventilation and this is another reminder that alveolar ventilation should be less than total pulmonary ventilation because alveolar accounts for dead space. Okay, so the second part of this question is a little bit more difficult. It says that Kamala hears Logan in the kitchen, so she stretches out her neck to talk with him without getting up, so she can stretch her neck. So how much should Kamala increase her tidal volume if she doubles her breathing rate and stretches her neck six feet, which increases dead space four times its original volume? if she wants to maintain the same alveolar ventilation. So I recommend pausing the video here, taking a few minutes, try to work this out on your own, and then come back, you can unpause, and I will start to work out the problem. Okay, so if we are looking for uh, we are looking for the increase in tidal volume. So we have, we have some values here. When we know this is the equation we're going to use. All right, so her, her new tidal volume, we don't know. Her new dead space, we know is 132 milliliters times four because it says 
Um, by stretching her neck, she increases her dead space to four times the original volume. The reason why dead space increases when she stretches her neck is because she stretches her trachea, and trachea is part of the conducting zone. So 132 times 4 gives us 528 milliliters. And we want to maintain the same alveolar ventilation. So we know that alveolar ventilation is what we had just solved for. All right, so let's plug these into our equation. So we have 6,816 milliliters per minute times um, respiratory rate in the problem. If you look at that real quick. It says she doubles her breathing rate. It was originally 12, so now it's 24 breaths per minute. And we don't know tidal volume, but we do know dead space. All right, so the first thing we should do is divide by 24 to get that out of the way. When we do that, our minutes cancel, and we get 6,816 divided by 24 gives me 284 mils per minute, no, not minute, mils per breath, and that's equal to tidal volume minus dead space, which is also in mils per breath. So if we just add the 528 to both sides, then we will get the new tidal volume. So plus 528. So the new tidal volume is 812 milliliters per breath. But we're not done yet because the question asked, um, the question asked how much should Kamala Khan increase her tidal volume? So the this is the new tidal volume. The old tidal volume was 700. So the change in tidal volume should be 112 milliliters per breath. So that is our answer. So if you got that correct, then good job. Um, you can always rewind this video and rewatch the explanation for it or try to work it out yourself starting from the paused version. Um, same thing with part one. So that's about as hard as these questions can get. So if you feel comfortable doing this Kamala Khan problem, then if we ask you to do a total pulmonary or alveolar ventilation equation on the exam, then you should feel very comfortable doing that. So that's all I have for this week's discussion. We're right at about 50 minutes, like discussion normally is. So next week I'll be going over gas transport, so the hemoglobin saturation curve, and then I'll also probably do a separate video on respiratory pathologies, which is a very relevant topic right now, given that we are recording this at home due to a respiratory pathology. Uh, but we'll be going over the ones you need to know for class and kind of where in the respiratory system uh, these pathologies are affecting. So I will see you on office hours um, later this week.